Pattern of the day, very briefly, um, we're going to hear from Sina Jungerstedt just in a moment, and then there'll be we'll go into breakout rooms for conversation, back out to hear from Colin and Jack, and then back into conversation. There will be opportunities to ask some questions and also to feedback, um, and that's the basic pattern of the day. But without further ado, as they say, um, I'd like to introduce Sina Jungerstedt. Uh, Sina is CEO and founding partner of Grip Now which is an innovation and strategy company based in Copenhagen. Uh, Sina was at the forefront of a wonderful Copenhagen's major transformation, leading the Destinations 2020 strategy, which declared the end of tourism as we know it, and set a new course towards tourism management and city enablement, which is people-based growth and localhood for everyone. So those are really nice resonant themes, I think. And in 2017, Sina was selected as one of Denmark's 100 top young business talents by Berninske Media. So Sina, you're very welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be part of this. I think it's a very interesting series. Um, so I'm actually just going to jump straight into sharing my slides. And so hopefully you can all see that now. And so, yes, as Kevin already introduced, I'm, uh, I'm Sina, I'm based here in Copenhagen. Um, I'm with a group now that I uh, co-founded a year ago. And uh, apart from what Kevin said, perhaps adding to that, one of the key things that we're really spending a lot of time working on is how to change the approach and the way that we think about tourism. Tourism, not as a goal in itself, but a shift towards tourism as a resource as the tools to create and build and develop better cities, better communities, or as Kevin was saying, people, place and planet. And that's actually also um, what we're doing right now uh, in a project in Belfast, where we're working with one of the other speakers, uh, Jack Spencer and Open Scale Interventions in relation to the redevelopment of Portview Trade Center, which I know Jack will talk about a bit later. But today, um, I'm going to talk about tourism as part of changing neighborhoods and changing cities within the theme. Um, and it's called localhood because as Kevin was saying, I, I, I was before the development director with Wonderful Copenhagen, which is the official tourism organization of Copenhagen here in Denmark. And uh, as that, I was responsible for launching the strategy in 2017 that came out and declared the end of tourism. Uh, which was, um, of course, uh, it caught a little bit of a, it, 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 it created a little bit of a stir as the official tourism organization coming out and declaring the end of tourism. Um, but the reason we did that was we wanted to sort of shift the conversation. So we wanted to, um, to not keep talking about things that are about to change or that are coming, but really say, no, in fact, you know, winter's already here and we need to start talking about it in a completely different way than we've uh, done before. And so we declared the end, but we also welcomed this new era of localhood. Um, and so localhood, if you're interested, you can go and read the strategy, but you won't find a definition of localhood in there. Um, but it's in, in, in some sort of short, it's kind of um, what makes a place somewhere and not anywhere. That's usually the brief way uh, that I talk about it. But it's also about a changing demand for travelers seeking towards more of the sort of local immersive experience. And it's about finding that balance between being a place that is visitable, but also being a place that is livable. So that's why we called it people based growth. So yeah, it's it's celebrating. Um, it's celebrating the place, it's celebrating the neighborhoods, it's celebrating the cities and and protecting uh, that which makes it uh, special. And so in the years after we launched the strategy, of course, um, that's when it got a lot of international attention, but it also got that attention because it was sort of, it came out at the same time as everyone started talking about over tourism and the issues of too much tourism, especially to cities in Europe. Um, and localhood was in many ways sort of framed as the response to that, even though at the time of writing, it wasn't really that big of an issue. Um, but uh, 
a lot of what made it interesting in that context was also that the response to over tourism in many of the European cities have been neighborhood tourism or dispersal as they we usually call it within tourism so it's basically sort of mitigating the heavy impact of tourism on popular city centers and um, inspiring people to seek beyond off the beaten track and so on so today that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of that approach what led to it and also um, how it works or doesn't and then find Finally, how the current crisis that we're in um, may push these trends uh, forward. So that's that was the introduction. Um, so yeah, in in the strategy, what we talk about is is sort of also this shift away from talking about tourists as almost like a species in themselves. <laughs> we 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 have a tendency to do that, um, but in fact, of course, very intuitively, tourists are people just like you and me. In fact, we are tourists as well. Uh, and so we wanted to change sort of the way that we sort of by calling them tourists, we also make them something that's separate, something that's almost like an invasive force that comes in, uh, or at least if not invasive of just not relevant to us. And so we shifted to talking about temporary locals um, as opposed to permanent locals, which are the locals or the local residents. Um, and so that's also, of course, because today no one actually really wants to identify as a uh, tourist. It's uncool in many ways. We want to be travelers or better yet, explorers. We want to blend in as much as possible and, and go for that authentic experience. As you can see in sort of the rise of the untouristy version of somewhere or eat like a local and all these different experiences that are now available. And this has also given rise to a lot of more sort of hybrid experience or merged experience. So this is an example from Copenhagen that has become really popular. This is, of course, all um, pre-COVID, but it's also uh, some of the experiences that I expect will um, will definitely continue to be popular uh, post-COVID. Uh, but uh, so this is a place, it's actually a former church that's been restored into a sort of open uh, communal kitchen. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it's equally open to locals and uh, visitors or temp uh, sorry, temporary locals. And, and it's a place where people just meet and share. Um, and we sh it's very easy to shift from English to Danish and back to English and so on. So it's, it's really sort of a shared space for everyone. Um, another example, this is from Amsterdam, uh, where you can go in and you can help an urban farm and meet uh, new people by weed dating. It's not weed dating as you may think it is, but it's uh, basically uh, picking up weeds in the farm. But it's, it's a different kind of experience that just gets people emerged and also uh, involved. Um, and of course, talking about Amsterdam, they have a very focused strategy on neighborhood tourism. And I think, uh, of course, mainly because it's a really, really popular tourism destination and especially the city centre has had an immense pressure that's also created a lot of tension between uh, people coming from the outside and the locals that actually live there. And as part of that, what they did was they did uh, an initiative called 24 Hour Amsterdam Editions, so it's basically invent eventing the neighbourhoods. And so it's, it's events that are actually um, facilitated by the locals, so there is a methodology, they come in, they help, uh, for the locals to sort of, you know, have a bar at the local yoga, yoga studio or a concert at the local brewery. And so they uh, get all the locals together to sort of really create that 24 hour of event. But the key target group here is actually other locals from other neighborhoods, because what they want is for the Amsterdamers to discover the different aspects, the different neighborhoods of uh, the city. And then the logic is that if the locals go, then the visitors will follow. Um, and so I think that's kind of an interesting approach to this whole idea of dispersal, because um, in Copenhagen, we've also uh, looked at this strategy and, and in wonderful Copenhagen, they continue to work with this strategy of sort of dispersal and uh, inspiring going to different neighborhoods, but often dispersal as a strategy is criticized because it seems to it's, it's often claimed that it's not really in the interest of the visitors, that visitors will continue to just want to see sort of the main highlights and, and that's really what they're coming for and that's what will make them happy. And so in Copenhagen, just before I uh, left the organization in wonderful Copenhagen, we launched the project called 10X Copenhagen, which was a lot of research on both visitors experience and uh, local resident sentiment and a lot of other things and one of the really interesting results that came out was that we could actually see from uh, the research that visitors satisfaction overall satisfaction with their trip to Copenhagen would increase um, by the number of neighborhoods that they visited while here 
So this is interesting because it actually shows that if we can just get visitors to go to more neighborhoods, they'll also have an overall better um, trip or stay in Copenhagen. And this was uh, not related to sort of travel experience, if they'd been to Copenhagen before or not. This was actually um, across all kinds of visitors, you could say. And so, of course, one thing is that there is a huge interest, there is a demand for that local experience, the authentic, getting immersed, going outside of the sort of touristic track into the neighborhood tourism of authentic experiences. Um, but uh, that may be traveler demand. And But of course, going to places that are untouristic, the tourism aspect will also impact those places that they're going to. Um, it will impact natural habitats or cultural heritage or, of course, local population. And that's hence the massive discussions that we've had on a, in the past five years or so on over tourism. Um, and so in many destinations, you've seen this launch of uh, pledges and promises really getting uh, visitors to think about uh, their impact and their responsibility to the place that they're visiting. And this will be in many ways key also to going to neighborhoods in, in, a, in sort of immersing into a local population because locals take responsibility for their communities, of course. They have to be there every day. So this is a way of communicating to visitors that we expect them to as well. Um, and I think in Amsterdam, there's a really interesting initiative here in the uh, red light districts, so one of the very, very popular uh, tourism districts of Amsterdam, where they put up posters on doors and windows and uh, everywhere walls of the locals who actually live in this neighborhood. And what was interesting about that, so you can see one example here is, and then it says, I live here. So that's really just increasing awareness of the fact that you're actually not visiting an amusement park or a tourist zone, you're visiting a local resident area. But what was also interesting about this was that the locals who were part of this campaign actually got to know each other because of the campaign. So, you know, they could recognize each other's faces and say hi. And that led to another initiative, which is now the, um, the I Live Here uh, locally driven uh, visitor center in the red light district. So it's, it's run by local residents and you can go in as a tourist and you'll get another version of what it means to live in this district. It's not just like touristic tips of where to get the best coffee or the best experience, but it's also just understanding what it means to be a local resident in this area. And so this is, of course, in many ways sort of marks the biggest paradigm shift, I think, that we haven't quite, we haven't quite managed it yet, but it's really been, it was a big trend before uh, COVID, and it, I expect it will be, and I'll explain in a bit as well after COVID, but it's really shifting, as I was starting to say, also how we think of tourism. It's not so much what locals can do for tourism or how a city can, what a city can do for tourism, but it's it's rather asking what tourism can do for locals or for the city or for the neighborhood or the community, because then it will matter and then it would make sense and it will also have a meaning and, uh, and a relevance to the locals and that will make them contribute and be part of it. So it doesn't come in as an invasive force, unintegrated and isolated from local life, but actually being part of it in a different way. And I think um, coming out of, or actually right now, we're still in the middle of, we were talking about that before we went live here and we're in the middle of the Corona dance going two steps forward and three back and no one really recognizes the music that we're playing to or dancing to. Um, but I think one of the things that we have seen in relation to the uh, pandemic is an awareness of how our individual choices can actually impact uh, collectively, both in terms of staying at home or you know, wearing a mask or whatever the local rules are where you're at. Um, but it's also in terms of our individual consumption choices and supporting local businesses. I think we've seen these campaigns pretty much all over the world, eat local, support local, buy local and so on. Because the in during the crisis, most destinations have had to experience what it means to have no visitors. And, and so you could say there will be an increased awareness of the at least the value added by uh, visitors coming in from the outside um, and uh, supporting and sustaining our businesses, but also, of course, locals themselves doing it. And hopefully this awareness of our local sort of consumption and the importance of that will go with us when we start traveling again, understanding that, you know, even uh, when we're somewhere else, the consumption choices we, we, we make will actually have an impact on the local communities that we're visiting. And you actually do see initiatives like this also from pre-COVID that um, like the Ripple score, which is basically a score that measures you can uh, that measures how much of your consumption in the destination will remain within the destination, and so it guides your uh, visitor choices or your destination choices. 
And so, of course, while this uh, whole pandemic crisis has been extremely challenging to um, all of us and to cities and neighborhoods, um, I think the pandemic has also created sort of a new demand for a different kind of experiences um, with safe distance to the crowds and then proximity and being close to those that really matter to us. Um, and while most city centers are really quite sort of dense and defined already, this offers opportunities to some of the neighborhoods actually to sort of grasp this new sort of um, traveler demand and not just travelers, but really um, our sort of cultural and experience demand, both as uh, permanent and temporary locals. And so I'm sure most of you have seen these pictures from Amsterdam where Mediamatic uh, launched these restaurants that since inspired several across the world um, with restaurants in greenhouses. And of course, this is, this this is in many ways like a, a temporary stunt, but it's also it's a stunt that will help a restaurant survive. <laughs> but it's also a way of showing that we're sort of grasping the uh, crisis that we're in. We're addressing the demands and the needs uh, and the fears of uh, people going out. Um, and it's reinventing a neighborhood in many ways as well. Um, and I think this example from Helsinki is also really good to sort of illustrate how COVID is creating um, a different need and a different urge for for different kind of experience. So this is basically the art festival in Helsinki that had to, of course, redefine how it was going to be held this summer. Um, and they changed it into the gift of art. So what you could do is you could go in and you could book an artist, in this case, a musician, and then you can have a private intimate um, concert in this case, in a park or in a backyard with just the people that were very close to you. So it's, and again, this is really something that's made possible across the entire cities and gives back culture to neighborhoods, not just in sort of big immersive uh, venues or, or, um, or event spaces. And so what we've seen is that this, time home alone has given room to reflect and evaluate a lot on what kind of city do we want on the other side. I think this webinar series is also a very good example of that. Um, and in many cases, this is also sort of put into focus how we approach and how we think about tourism development in our cities, bringing back more qual quality local life, as in Lisbon, where they're looking at bringing back more permanent life into the city by uh, renegotiating in terms of short term and longer term rentals. Um, and I think interestingly, and, and I know this is actually something uh, that you're very good at in Belfast, but interestingly, we've also seen a rise sort of in um, participatory, almost democratic processes in terms of collecting input for the cities that we want, but also in terms of the tourism that we want. And I think this is this is really an important development which hasn't been that strong before, not just asking whether or not locals actually support tourism or tourism growth or like tourism or doesn't like tourism, but asking locals and local stakeholders, local businesses, what kind of tourism, what should tourism look like? How can we make tourism a resource to our, um, to our cities and places? And so that's, of course, uh, important also because, as I was starting by saying, tourism can't be an isolated or invasive almost force that just adds several million to our population without being integrated into our planning. I think this is one of the main things that I, I realized myself in as we were working with this in Copenhagen that, you know, in Copenhagen is quite a small capital city. We have, I guess, around 700 or 800,000 um, population. But uh, we also have about uh, over 10 million bed nights a year, which is, is just an incredible temporary population that's, you know, we should plan according to, but we should also make it part of that democratic process. Because in the end, you know, all of us who are working in tourism or making a living off tourism, we're completely dependent on that ecosystem that we're part of, whether it's uh, the hyperlocal neighborhood or it's the overall city or the destination. Um, we're dependent on that because if you have a hotel, no one travels just because there is an available bed. You travel somewhere because there is a special kind of atmosphere. There's a special kind of experience. It will, um, it will transform you in some way or another. A special kind of localhood and in, and in that sense that requires all of us it takes a village and I, I saw a quote by a tourism minister from Costa Rica say you can't have a five-star hotel in a one-star community um, and so that would be sort of my provocation to uh, you today in discussing and exploring how tourism could be part of changing neighborhoods and changing the city of Belfast um, for the positive. Asina, thanks very much. That was fantastic. Um, I'm particularly interested in what kind of a city um, do we want 
as we go through and come come through this uh, current pandemic. And um, there are going to be breakout rooms which you can go. Uh, please uh, do that. The thing we're we're asking really at this point is you can discuss, say hello to each other, discuss what's what you've heard from Cena. And then there's a question about how is your neighbourhood changing as this global pandemic progresses. So you can use that as a starter. See you in a moment. Hi everyone. Uh, well now. We have a little time for a quick bit of feedback, so it'll be interesting. Um, we don't have to hear from everyone, but if anybody has one thing that's really jumped out at them and would like to share from their group, um, please do so you can, in the traditional way, stick your hand up. Um, it'd be nice to hear from at least one or two groups, I think. So anybody... I can see Jack. When did you kick us off, Jack? Well, then, yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off, get us out of the way. Um, group, I think we were in breakout room four. So we, we uh, just really quickly, I suppose, we, we started off the discussion talking about how interestingly, um, because of COVID, um, neighbourhoods almost seem to be benefiting a little bit, exactly like Sinya was saying, you know, there's sort of this, um, you know, community spirit a little bit, and you're starting to realise that the five or 10 or 15 minute walk from your house is so important. Um, you know, in the green space and the access to services and that kind of thing. Um, but then on the flip side of that, um, you know, people working within the city are, are, are struggling um, and, and the city centres obviously are struggling. So I suppose the conversation then turned to how, what can we do uh, a little bit where we can bring in some of the benefits of neighbourhoods into cities and, and, and talk about obviously people living in cities. Um, and then we talked about obviously connection between neighbourhoods and, and how traditionally in Belfast, obviously that's been a very uh, difficult thing. Um, but how that's potentially changing now with, with transport routes, but just needs to continue to change, I suppose, and how we start to connect across the city and connect neighbourhoods and connect, um, uh, you know, connect areas and, and how the, the cultural sector can start to play, uh, to play a part in that as well through interventions and activities and festivals and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that, that was it in a nutshell, I suppose, but obviously if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. Thanks, Jack. Uh, in our group, there was an interesting um, connection between two two grassroots projects in Ormo and in Dundonald, who, who kind of recognised uh, a number of the challenges and opportunities that they were facing and doing something um, from the, the grassroots up. Um, so that was really interesting to, to that idea Jack's just saying about connecting. So not only connecting in your own local neighbourhood, but maybe the idea of connecting with shared experience with other neighborhoods and then this in this kind of online world that could be a neighborhood anywhere could be in copenhagen could be elsewhere i, th so I think um kevin if i can just pick up on that that um if we can identify the uh the places where there are these grassroots grassroots groups obviously i didn't know about uh, the ormo open ormo community collective and they probably didn't know about don donald art corridor so there's the potential there for us to organize something where we swap um, and we put on a thing one day and they put on a thing the next day and we go to each other's neighborhoods and, and um, see what, you know, just visit each other's spaces or do whatever uh, there is to uh, to be done, you know? Yeah, well, that's a that's a, a brilliant idea, says Kerry. Um, but <laughs> I, and I think it's it's, sometimes you know, just for people's benefit who might not be from Belfast, how far is Dundonald away from Ormo in terms of miles, roughly? Uh, it's a four, four miles, maybe? Sorry, four, four miles, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's an interesting thought about the opportunities locally, you know, if you really mm -hmm. think about the richness in your local area. So last group, maybe, let's, let's, try, let's try three. Who was in group three who's going to say something? I was in group three. Um, really interesting discussion. Some great people in my group. Um, so we have Federica, and I'd like Federica to maybe to talk a wee bit about her um, initiative that has been developed through um, in the Duncairn, North Belfast, where we have an, a wonderful event every Sunday, where has, which has become really, really popular. And Federico's point was, it's great to have something that we've got so many great festivals, but it's a bit of a lottery of a visitor encountering um, those festivals. So having something that's regular is a really important thing for you know, locals to celebrate and attract visitors to their area. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And Nisha had some really good points in my group. Nisha wants to have a quick um, few seconds. Yes, I think uh, um, in Belfast we have a lot of nice festivals, 
And as Nisha was saying, they're absolutely fundamental to introducing communities and new communities to each other um, <clears throat> in different areas of the city and different neighborhoods. But at the same time, I think we need a more sustained uh, cultural activity so that uh, there's always something going on. It doesn't need to be a festival for uh, a reason to go to a certain neighborhood, but there's always something interesting happening. Um, so that was the, the main idea. We do have at the Dunkern where I work uh, before COVID, we used to have a monthly appointment of the Sunday breakfast session where there is live music for free and people come through the door, have breakfast there and enjoy the music and there's arts uh, activities for the kids. So it doesn't need to be a specific festival, but something like that happening all the time uh, that would definitely uh, attract locals and foreigners and visitors uh, to a neighborhood. Yeah, uh, my, my point was, and I totally agree with uh, Pedrica, what she has said, I think it is very important. Yes, festivals are important part of our cities, which bring in quite a lot of international tourism and travel, but we need to revive our local neighborhoods. But in that revival, I do not, I just feel that um, that the, it's okay for the two main denominations to keep doing what they are doing and making partnerships with East, West and West, East. But I think in that the new communities have been forgotten about. Yes, everybody will say, okay, we are going to Culture Night, we are going to Belfast Mela, or we are going to, um, you know, Children's Festival and all those sort of things, you know, the festivals, but there is nothing beyond that. And there are so many empty spaces within the cities, um, all around our city and in, even on the high streets. Why is it that the cultural experience cannot be brought onto those empty spaces while it could be the pop-up shops or it could be anything which we want to do? Give us the opportunity. And that's what we are missing. Uh, just because we are small cultural organizations uh, we will, we just do not get those opportunities to explore our expertise and we are very creative people working in the creative industries and we can really animate the cities and the neighborhoods really well and give the tourism that experience and the local people that experience. So I just feel that that's what it is missing. Um, and I think from today, maybe we can revisit all that uh, in a, uh, another way you know Ke that process. Mm. Kevin can I come in there? Absolutely. Hi my name's Anya McCabe with Phelan Fubble. Um, I think in terms of I agree with Misha in terms of we need to have more um, conversations and more inclusiveness in all of what we do but um, I would say that it's not just th this whole and sometimes uh, um, you know it gets frustrating about the two denominations I mean Phelan Fubble is a festival um, primarily um, that grew from West Belfast, but we're certainly an inclusive festival. Certainly Nisha's group has taken part in it over the many, many years. We have um, year long uh, work that we do with the BME communities and they come and they do events and that other thing in their own right, as opposed to being an add on in that. And we have focus groups and work with the West Belfast Roundtable that, that ensures that in the same way that we have focus groups with our young people and our old, but you know, we all could do with more cultural activities, diversity and that in all of our programs. I would agree with that, certainly. Karen, can I speak? Please do. Um, the, I just want to pick Nisha up on the point, and it's something that commonly gets talked about, say, why can't we have more pop-up shops? I, I, I'm going to speak up for uh, unpopular people who are the landlords. Pop-up shop, <laughs> pop shops work for everybody except landlords. Landlords have bigger mortgages than you or I can ever dream of. Pop-up shops work for the council because they get their rates paid. They work for the tenant because they get to run a business with little or no rent uh, in, in possibly a really good location. Landlords still has to pay the money back to the, to the mortgager who lent him the money to have the property. The only time pop-up shops really work, you know, in a, in a proper economy, as it were, is when the person, the tenant is a charity. If charity, if you've got charitable status, the landlord saves on the rates 
And that's a really good encouragement for them to open up their, their unit and give it over to somebody temporarily. If you can find a whole group of charities who are willing to do these things related to arts or whatever, and believe me, I'm not the only shopping centre manager in Northern Ireland who would welcome you in. And there are loads of people on the high street who would do the same. But the secret has to be that everybody has to try and gain out of this. We can't always expect the landlord to just give things away for free because sure, they've got money, they're a landlord. It's not the case. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for all of the diversity of ideas. And please feel free to challenge as well as to build on any points. That's, uh, that, that, that's very welcome. Yeah, so lots of interesting and some emerging, I suppose, tensions between how do we make all of these things work. But I, I feel there's a real strong sense of, of coherence around how, that some of these challenges could be met together. Um, but I think we should move on now. Um, I'm going to I'm going to find my little sheet, which tells me about uh, Jack Spencer, even though I kind of know it, but I, it's difficult to do it from heart. Um, but we're going to have a, a provocation first from Jack and then from Colin Pigeon. So I'll give you them both, both their uh, brief bios now, and then they can uh, get on and, and, and uh, share their um, insights. So Jack is a, is a partner at Urban Scale Interventions, which is a Belfast based creative studio that tackles city challenges through people centered design. Jack himself has worked on a diverse array of people-centered innovation projects for global brands, including Google, Facebook, Ikea, and Unilever. And he's currently authoring a book for Rutledge on the influence of design on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And Colin, Colin, Pigeon, Colin is an economics and public finance researcher who began painting in his spare time to help manage uh, things like anxiety and insomnia. And during a period working at Dundonald High School, he saw the connection between well-being and local spaces and decided to establish the Dundonald Art Corridor. The initiative is a collaboration galvanizing the community to improve the local environment and exhibit on 10 public walls that up until then were dead, ugly spaces. So in 100 days, uh, Colin led a transformation of the neighborhood and the well-being of, of local people. So you're both very welcome. And Jack, uh, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And um, thanks for uh, having me here to talk. There's some great discussion already. And um, hopefully uh, what I'll share today briefly will we'll, we'll add to that and, and, um, and hopefully as well add to, to some of what Colin's got to say. Um, I was going to talk a little bit just about, um, if you can see my screen there, I think it's loading up. Um, uh, just about some of the work that we're doing at the moment on kind of active citizenship and, and, and promoting um, uh, promoting participation in some of the projects that we do, um, particularly in, in, in Belfast. Um, just really quickly, a little bit about us, um, Urban Scale Interventions, as, uh, as, as Kevin said there. Um, so we're a Belfast-based creative studio, um, and really we, um, we work across three um, main um, sort of strands. So we work across um, various different cultural projects. We do a lot of work around public space and, and well-being um, and, and mental health, and we do quite a lot of work with the Public Health Agency on, on some of that. Um, and, uh, and we work um, in, in kind of policy and strategy as well, um, looking at how we can co-design some, uh, some of those. Um, a little bit about, I suppose, where we sit, our, our sweet spot, if you like, our Venn diagram um, of, of, of kind of where we find ourselves um, is between people, place and purpose. So um, people being really all about that kind of um, community buy-in and, and, um, and understanding uh, issues and, and the challenges that are happening um, in neighbourhoods and within communities through in-depth. Uh, kind of qualitative research on the ground. Purpose, we do a lot of work um, at, obviously with the social impact, whether that's improving well-being or connection or, um, or, or economy or tourism. Um, and, uh, and place, we recognise that everywhere we work, um, whether that's a building, a city or a neighbourhood, it's got a story or a history and a heritage and, and, and we want to bring that through and, and understand what that is. Um, the way we work across projects, we, we work um, uh, with the double diamond design, um, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with, but it was it's quite an established design framework um, that was done by the Design Council about 15 years ago, the UK Design Council. Um, and it's just a way of framing um, our, our design process into sort of a first chunk, which is around research and framing the problem, and then a second chunk, which is around um, developing ideas and, and then delivering them. Um, so what that looks like for us, I suppose, is in that first phase of discovering, we go out and understand real needs and what those real challenges are um, through um, through kind of in-depth qualitative research. And we then kind of define the, um, 
the opportunity areas, I suppose, and we actually understand, okay, what are we actually trying to achieve here? What are some of the challenges and how, how do we go about that? Um, then we develop um, ideas and we test and we iterate and we prototype. And we usually do that obviously with, a, with people that, you know, in those communities, in those neighborhoods. Um, and then we actually deliver, you know, deliver those ideas and try and make them tangible and real within those communities. Um, so I suppose a little bit when, when we talk about design, we, we, you know, we sort of ask our quest, the question, you know, who, who is design for? And um, I suppose rather cheesily, we, we sort of say, well, you know, design is for everyone. And especially when we talk about placemaking and, and design in, in, in public space, you know, design should be for everyone and it should be inclusive. Um, and so what we start to um, use is how do we build or, or look at using lived experience to create great ideas that build ownership um, within, those, uh, you know, within those spaces and build a sense of belonging. Um, uh, to empower citizens, as, um, as, as we spoke about, uh, as Kevin and Sinia, I think, spoke, spoke about earlier. Um, so that, you know, obviously we don't want to be um, uh, there throughout. So how do we empower citizens to, to, to actually um, take a little bit of ownership of, of some of those projects? Um, and when we engage, why, why do we do it? Well, typically there's, I suppose, four kind of main reasons why we go out and talk to people really in the first place. Um, one is around inspiration. So how do we actually generate new and interesting ideas? And obviously going out and talking to people is the best way of doing that. Um, sometimes it's about validation. So it's actually about testing and evaluating some of the, some ideas that we might have. Um, there's a little bit of awareness raising. So if, if there's a particular initiative or, or challenge that, we, um, that, that, we're, that we're working on, how do we raise awareness around that? And then obviously like I say, that, that last one there about how do we actually um, sort of get buy-in from, from local people that, that you know, what we're doing is, is um, is tackling a, a real problem that they're facing. Um, so I suppose I'll just spend the, the next couple of minutes just talking about some examples of where we've sort of gone through that process um, within um, some of the projects in Belfast. Um, so this was the the uh, the city imagining the, the cultural strategy, which um, which we've we've already talked about today. So we worked a little bit on um, uh, on this and how do we get. Um, people's input into what is ultimately a, a council strategy um, and how do we actually start to take this back out to um, to people and citizens within Belfast to understand well actually what does cultural led development look like over the next 10 years so with this we opened up a, a, a pop-up shop at the risk of um, <laughs> at the risk of making an enemy there with, with, with Jamie but um, so we opened a, a pop-up shop on the Royal Avenue um, in, in Belfast um, for about six weeks over the summer last year um, and we invited people to come in, whether they could come in for a minute or an hour or a day um, and really um, share their ideas and, and really kind of take that strategy on a very kind of practical and tangible level um, to, to, to people, um, uh, you know, young and old and, and, uh, and right across Belfast um, to really work on well, what does that mean? What, what, what does this cultural strategy mean and what might we be able to deliver from it? That led, that's led to a, a number of kind of interventions and projects, one of which the challenge sort of came up around the lack of green spaces within the city centre. So can we start to work on projects, the Million Trees Initiative and Urban Forests and, and things like that, that might start to um, green um, some areas of, of, of Belfast, um, of central Belfast. Um, we talked a little bit about festivals and, and some of that um, has obviously come through and, and we're working on the Maritime Festival at the moment actually about how do we start to connect, use, you know, potentially use the festival to, um, to, to, to kind of um, connect the city more a little bit and, and connect uh, the city to the river and to the lagoon and might we do that through kind of playful installations such as a, a giant lido or a giant swimming pool on the lagoon but how do we actually get people to, um, to the river's edge. Um, and other, um, other sort of projects that came up through that, so um, making... I did warn everyone in the comments there, I'm an economist by training. I'm not... A... <laughs> so I am an artist of sorts, but my presentation is very different from those nice professional ones you just see. So... I'm going to talk to you about Dundonald Art Corridor. Um, now, what is behind this is basically uh, I moved to Dundonald in 2005. And from that day, pretty much a lot of walking up and down towards the uh, primary school over to um, various things that my kids were going to, library, stuff like that, and walking past a bunch of disused spaces that were just ugly and um, I was saying to a friend a while back, it'd be good if someone did something about that space there. And then he challenged me and said, um, why don't you do it? 
So that's where this came from. Um, so this is me, uh, just to prove that I, I paint. Uh, that was part of my COVID response uh, over Easter weekend. Um, and that's now actually exhibited by our local McDonald's on their fence. Um, it's my website, should you need to contact me. Uh, but basically I've got three points about how we can encourage citizenship and creativity in our neighborhoods, which was the, the, the brief. Um, the first thing is to forget about funding. Um, I know that would be an issue for a lot of people. Uh, the second thing is build it and they will come. And I think that's something that perhaps Jack was gonna come on to talk about. How about waiting for other people to do things doesn't get things done. So if you just start and do it, then it builds into a bigger thing. Um, and when you're doing that, what we try to do is start small and do it well, and then build out and spread. Um, so this is basically a, a, a kind of mock-up of the Dundonald Art Corridor area. You'll see in the middle there, there's a crossroads. That's what is basically called Dundonald Village. A um, hundred years ago, that's all there was. There was a church, a pub, a row of about eight houses and a few farms and mills. Now there's 10,000 households, 16, 17,000 people uh, spread into these gigantic estates and suburbs. Um, but this is still the area that that really is what people would call the village, um, but it's disused and dilapidated. Uh, so to give an example of what we've done, uh, this is a space that used to have a mobile butchers in it before I was here 20 years ago. Um, I got a group of volunteers from work and we shoveled out all the filth and muck that was there. We cleared up um, the litter and we transformed it into a street gallery. Um, so hopefully you'll agree that's better looking than it was. Um, we've used it to hold events. We had a thing called the Dundonald Art Corridor Live or DAC Live when we had a, an artist in residence came and painted a, a piece while people could drop in and look and watch and chat to the artist about what she was doing. Um, we've had, uh, that's actually from the launch event, but um, organically we have had artists come forward and just offer us work. Now that uh, young lady there who's cutting the ribbon, um, I actually now, but I bought her piece of work and it's on my wall. Um, and uh, as an 11 year old or, or perhaps 12 year old now, to be able to sell a piece of art for 50 quid um, on an online auction, is such a boost to self-esteem. Uh, and then this is a piece that um, was done by a lady who lives nearby. She paints to help deal with chronic pain and fatigue uh, and she creates and we've given her a space to exhibit. Um, and then this uh, is the Dundonald Art Corridor Aquarium that appeared during lockdown. Uh, my daughter and I painted the, the background and then we just said, look, the aquarium's here, it needs some fish and it gave local kids something to do during that period when they couldn't do anything else. They made their fish, then during their, week, their daily exercise, they came down, pinned it up on the board with a drawing pin or whatever they had to hand, and maybe took a photo, selfie with it. And um, it really gave us something to focus on as a, as a community. Um, we then created the uh, street gallery butterfly bush which wasn't quite such a success, but we did get a parrot, which I was quite pleased with. Um, and people were like, they either made things on plastic or they stuck things on with clothes pegs. Or, um, it, it, to me, to call it art is maybe a stretch. It's not, about the, it's not about the art, it's about the process of making it and involving people. Um, we awarded this wee lad here, Don Donald Young Poet, um, and created a wall just with some old, old recycled material. Uh, now it doesn't look great. We will work on making that look a bit sharper, but that's his poem there. He has subsequently been published um, and uh, it's giving opportunities to young people to show what they can do. Uh, we ran a competition in the local high school. Um, Mother Spaces, Kids Corner, which is basically a wall on a car park. Um, got some local people together, had a working party, painted it. Uh, that's what more what it looks like now. You can see a couple of local uh, graffiti artists did a piece for us. Um, there's a little uh, We Free Library and behind it also there's the Kids Corner Art Gallery, which people then can go and look at um, 
the signboard there that I've just put in the square, um, that was done by the local nursery. They were, all the kids did little fingerprints in it. And um, again, we need to frame it, but, but the point is it's there and people are looking at it and young people are getting to show people what they can do. Um, there are other spaces, a local optician let us use a bit of his wall. So we recently launched a piece we call I Spy, which was done at a community day. Um, basically I spent a night taping up um, masking tape, loads of spaces then, and people came along, they painted a black bit and we had this space then, uh, which we, we put up on the wall. Uh, Sam then, who's the optician, gives us a hundred quid, which we'll use to buy paint to do something else in the future. Um, we have a few other spaces. We have a local park, which has been tremendous. Um, Don Donald Rock Snake, which started during lockdown, grew out of Don Donald Rocks, which was a group, basically a game where you paint a rock and you hide it. Um, we created a rock snake, which was several thousand, I think it was about 3000 stones, painted stones that people had delivered in. Now they've been collected up. The best ones, we'll, we'll put them together and um, Don Donald Rocks are gonna select those and then install them uh, working with the council into some sort of permanent uh, record of this time. Um, just quickly then, the food bank allowed us to put some stuff on the front of their, their building. That was a piece done by a local, uh, the local special school, Tor Bank, as part of its um, shared education project um, with the mainstream primary school and also Longstone School. They have a mixed class at P7. Now these are difficult to do at the moment, unfortunately, because schools can't mix. Uh, they're gonna be closed from Monday. Um, but that got us to involve three big local schools. So then it, it, it means that lots of people have a stake in the project. Um, that's now been replaced with a piece that I did, uh, just painting with Don Donald Mott and, um, or Moat even. And uh, that will be replaced again by Torbank uh, when they get some time to do it. So uh, forget about funding. We've had about 300 quid donated by four, four local businesses for paint, materials. We crowdfunded our insurance. We raised 150 quid at Asda. We've sold art for about 150 quid. Most of that went to the artists. A lot, well, it all went to the artists and then most of them donated it back to the art corridor. Um, not all of them did. There was no requirement to do so. Uh, all the wood and Fomex is pulled out of skips. It's taken from a local printing company. Uh, it's all recycled. We get it for nothing. We had a bunch of waste paint donated. We had put out an appeal and people gave us uh, masonry paint that they had in their shed for 20 years. And we're just using that. Um, if you build it, they'll come like the aquarium shows. Now, if we can roll that out, lockdown, unfortunately, in a way, has got in the way, but we can replicate that in other spaces and have other things that people can do. So we've involved three local schools. We've had artists come forward. We've had writers. We've got joiners have volunteered. We've got the food bank involved. There's churches and community groups involved. McDonald's have supported us with spaces. The council then are sharing our spaces and approached us recently to see if we could do something for Mental Health Day. Um, so these things come. But the key is to is to start small and to do whatever you do as well as you can and then build from there. Uh, I think that's me. Colin, thanks very much. I mean, there's still lots of comments on the chat. So if you take a moment to read them, some basic questions. But uh, as Jack got thrown out and he's now back with us, I, uh, hopefully you're still with us, Jack. Maybe we could pick up and then we'll have questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thank you, Colin, for rescuing me. And apologies, everyone, as I was rattling on. And uh, obviously the the uh, the Internet didn't want me to uh, didn't want me to talk. But really interestingly, actually, Colin, great, great presentation and great initiative. And I think hopefully um, that will come in. Who knew that we'll dovetail quite nicely with, with one of this project that I was just going to touch on. Um, Bright Ideas, which is a, a project that we're doing up in North Belfast um, in Ardoin and Ballisillan, um, and it's looking at how do we um, how do we look at access to green space and community cohesion in, in those two areas. Um, and kind of, I suppose, in a similar vein, actually, to, to, to what Colin was talking about, we kind of found a, a, a bit of disused space. It was actually a contested space and it was used largely for, for, for kind of um, uh, rubbish and, and fly tipping. Um, and we did, uh, you know, a lot of uh, community engagement work there, you know, talking about how there's a lack of green space and there's a lack of colour in the neighbourhoods and that kind of thing. And so we popped up this teepee that was actually there 
um, at the, uh, for the first uh, sort of three or four months of this year. Um, really just to sort of say, hey, you know, look at all these random spaces or these random gray spaces and abandoned spaces that aren't being used. What could we start to, what could we start to do with them? And, and again, we had, you know, workshops there and people started to come out and say, okay, actually, you know, we can, we can start to do some interesting things there. And that started to lead onto questions around what we could do for other spaces in the neighborhood and, and more longer term regeneration and, and opportunities to impact sort of bringing color and, and green space into, into some of those neighborhoods. Um, like I say, we went out and did, uh, did quite a lot of work um, with local groups there and, and local residents and local schools and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and we did, you know, kind of a, similar to, to what Colin's saying, you know, we, we worked with local schools, we, we did um, superhero packs and, 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 you know, asked local kids if they were a superhero, what, what would they want to see, you know, in their local area. And we had some great ideas and initiatives come back from that. Um, and what ended up happening from that is we started to generate ideas within the community. So local people and local ideas started to, to, to come through um, and we put them forward on quite a simple web platform that people within the local area could start to vote on. And then we could start to see, can we actually, you know, at a very practical level, start to implement some of these ideas. Um, uh, and, and what's ended up happening then is throughout lockdown, actually, we've been trying to, um, to, to implement some of those ideas. So this is one initiative. Um, where actually it was a young group of, of um, 16, 17 year olds from a, from a community group there, um, started to talk about bringing nature, how do they bring nature into Ardorn and Ballysillen and some of these areas that are quite gray and, uh, and, and, and not much green space. Um, and one of the ideas was a, was a bird box. And so we, we designed up and, and, and built with these young people um, this bird box and we distributed 200 bird boxes um, uh, throughout lockdown to, to, um, to, to, to families in Ardoin and Ballycillen and they could sort of build them in like an Ikea style um, way and paint them. Um, and now there's, there's 200 bird boxes in, in, in Ardoin and Ballycillen, obviously, um, you know, it, it starts to lead into that uh, longer term question of what can we do to bring nature actually into our, you know, into our neighborhoods. Um, another nice one was um, uh, an idea that came forward about a recipe share. So the older generation shared their favorite food and favorite recipes. The younger generation then cooked it and shared the, the meal back to the, to the older generation. Um, and again, we, we, um, you know, we started to deliver that through, um, through lockdown, which was, um, you know, which was great to see. Um, and then we've got a final one that we're just trying to get over the line now. And this interestingly comes into that question, I suppose, around permissions. But one of the ideas was how do we brighten up the streets? Um, uh, and one idea that came forward was around brightening up the lampposts and can we wrap the lamppost in really colourful vinyl that the young people have designed. Um, and, and so we've got 200 lampposts that we're, that we're wrapping with, with vinyl. But again, there's that sort of question between permissions and, and who owns the lamppost and that kind of thing that we're, we're just navigating at the moment. Um, final project I was just going to touch on is Portview in, in uh, East Belfast, uh, just off the Newton Arts Road, which is one we're working on with Senior. Um, and this is a project where there's, uh, it's about 17, it's, a, it's an old spinning mill and there's about 17,000 meters uh, squared of, of space of which about 11,000 is empty, currently disused space. Um, and we're starting to look at what could that look like as a, as a community hub and what would that look like um, if we started to redevelop that um, as a space for innovation and, and curiosity, particularly for the local community there that builds on heritage, uh, provides opportunity for education and training, resilience, um, obviously innovation and employment opportunities, but also neighbourhood tourism. So really talking about what Senior was talking about earlier in terms of how do we how do we look at what our neighbourhoods have and, and from a tourism point of view. Um, we launched What's the Story? So this was our kind of engagement platform, if you like, and, and you're welcome to, to, to go on there. Um, and again, this was about finding out what does that mill mean, that space, that building mean for local people and people in the area. So please do share your stories with us if you have any of, of the Portview Trade Centre or the old Strand Spinning Mill on Newton Arts Road. But that led to some really interesting stories about the, the history of this space as one of being a place of, um, ironically, where, or weirdly, where the, the, the kind of first banana, um, the guy that, that, invent, uh, that brought bananas almost to the British Isles was, was from. Um, uh, and even some of the mill workers started when they were on strike started chanting about bananas so then you start to uh, start to look at well okay are there innovative ideas about how we might be able to grow bananas on site and and um, turn that into uh, you know something that we could celebrate within Belfast a really unique history and story that that hasn't been told before um, you know and you can start to see how it might play out at, at Belfast restaurant week for example and, and we bring on board further further players um, and this is some of seniors work but looking at you know, this isn't this isn't about tourism, but this is uh, you know this is a unique story that we can start to bring through um, that actually creates 
uh, something for for local people as well as acting as a, a sort of a, a, a longer term um, regeneration opportunity around potential innovation and tourism hub um, within East Belfast. Um, so that's the ambition there, and, and, and there's been um, there's been a heritage lottery grant to to, to start to look into that, um, which is really exciting. So. Um, apologies for the slightly bridged um, uh, presentation, but thanks, Colin, for filling in for me. I was going to fill in uh, with some final thoughts that actually I think really just echo what Colin was was um, was talking about, which is, I suppose, what we've learned on our journey of um, of, of, of engagement um, over the last few years. We've got an adapt. Uh, we've got a clear process, but it's adaptable. We work with steering groups usually on the grounds. Um, we talk a lot about building up and, and kind of building down. So we, we talk a lot about how we work within levels of kind of uh, you know, policy and 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 um, kind of uh, council and, and government levels, but also very importantly, you know, at that community level and, and on the ground. Um, I think exactly like Colin's saying, you know, there's existing ideas, we just need to fuel them. Um, quick and cheap action, so exactly what Colin's saying about lack of funding, but, you know, I like this, this not, not my phrase, but start by starting, you know, and exactly what, what kind of Colin did by the, by the sounds of it, you know, find a, find a space and let's start, you know, let's not wait for funding or wait for, you know, to get everyone aligned. Um, and be bold and, and people will follow. So um, that's, uh, that's my cue, I suppose, to, um, to, to, to end the slide share, but thanks. Jack, fantastic, thank you. And, 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 and it's always tricky when the internet doesn't work in our favor. <laughs> and thank you both, and thank you, Colin, too. Uh, really inspirational stuff um, from, from both of you. Um, I, I'm struck, we'll have a, we've time for maybe one or two questions, but I'm struck by that idea of that you definitely to do this, you need you need enablers, um, people like Colin, for example, but you also need an enabling environment. So I think that's where Belfast City Council and organizations such as USI or arts organizations or other civil society organizations come in, because in the end, we're all part of local places. So even if we happen to be in the council, we are people who live in local places. So it's really interesting to think about that. And the other thing I loved was that was definitely you're heading towards that strap line, Belfast is bananas. Um, that, that I thought was fantastic. So um, I, I offer that up for free. Um, but any quick questions before we move back into breakout rooms? We have a couple of minutes. Uh, can I come in with a quick question, Kevin? You can. Um, so I'll, I'll put it to Jack or Colin, whomever. Um, but I think that was a really good point about enablers and a lot of us work in organisations here where we are um, actively tasked with being enablers ourselves. But it is the value of individuals like Colin that enable really authentic stories, action that is very much directed towards local need. Um, are there any tips and tricks for um, instigating local enablers, local individuals to be enablers? Oh, well, Colin or Jack or both? Um, you need an individual with such apparent charm and charisma. <laughs> you know? um, look, in every community, there are people who are have the, the desire to make things better. And there are also people who don't. Now the key is what you're saying is how do you find those? And I think that's where the that's where the the council comes in. You put out a call, and you put out a call for people who want to improve a space. And I think at the same time, it what what's key is having some spaces to work on. So one of the questions in the chat was how do we get permission? Well, I, I just asked and got it. Now, in other spaces that won't be so readily available. So is there a way that the council can say, who's got a wall, who's got a space, um, and then match those people up with, with people who are gonna put something on it? Just a thought. Yeah, and I think from our side, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, um, you know, how to, how to find those enablers. I think as well, we work um, quite hard um, in the initial phases of projects to really um, sort of delve into um, those communities, but also um, try and find, you know, it's not always the loudest voice, I suppose, is the, you know, is, is, is the sort of classic, um, you know, there, there's always, pe always people doing really interesting stuff um, within communities. Um, uh, but there's also sometimes uh, people who are sort of a little bit more shy or reserved or not quite got the, um, uh, you know, the resource or whatever it might be to, to, to share their ideas. So it's about getting to them as well. So, 
you know, how, how do we um, go beyond just um, uh, the, the kind of the loudest voices in the room and, and try and find people um, uh, and, and give them the tools to then start to, you know, to, to enable them to, to develop their ideas. Um, uh, if, you know, if, if that helps. <laughs> yeah, thank you both. Um, uh, hopefully Mimi that, that, that did help. Yeah, super. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, okay. so let so listen. We're going to move. Um, please keep using the chat. We're going to move uh, uh, in a moment. Just uh, we're going to uh, the question that might help start. But please feel free to start with your own question. But so, how do we encourage positive transformation led by local people? So uh, a lot about the series is about is yeah exploring the ideas, but it's also about how do we begin to move into action? And, and we've got some real. Um, uh, ideas around that just through this conversation i think but as we go into the breakout rooms uh please feel free to chat about what you would like uh, they'll pop up now and see you shortly welcome back sorry about the brutality of zoom which um uh, gives you suddenly gives you 60 seconds to be quiet so uh, i'm glad you've all uh, stuck with it anybody some ideas that came up in their sessions or or with other provocations or challenges they would like to throw out um, I might have a say a few words about our room, um, and I'd like to invite Claire if you would like just to talk about your initiative that's running in Chester, and it's just so nice to see such a, a wonderful range of people that have been talking today and participating. Uh, but Claire's from Chester, and she's running in some uh, very interesting initiatives there that we can learn from in Belfast, and I think that hopefully Claire is learning from. What we're doing in Belfast. So, Claire, are you are you there? Yes. Um, I was invited to join your meeting by Chester Visual Arts Forum, and um, so we meet on a regular basis. We've got the university, we've got the council, we've got business people, we've got a, a real combination of people, and that's one initiative. And you were doing pop up shops, and there's lots happening. What's happening tonight at five thirty is five local people have been invited to do a video to go around the city and maybe look at the spaces they value in, you know, for whatever reason they value that maybe is a space to perform. I don't know. I'm looking forward to seeing what they've come back with. Short video, but with, with what next? Um, another initiative that we do is Good For Nothing, which is an, an, international, um, an international body, but we have a local little group. So two people run it voluntarily, but if something happens, someone comes up with an idea and one guy wanted to do a, a, dish, a horrible subway in the city and make it better, wanted to plant it, copying the Singapore Super Trees initiative. We've got a very scaled down version, but that scaled down version has happened because Good For Nothing invites people who are interested to join in for a day. So Friday night, all day Saturday, we had town planners, we had web designers, we had artists, we had locals, we had, you name it, people gave up a day. The guy put his presentation, I want to make, you know, a Super Trees initiative. And we all threw ideas, we broke out, we, and, and it's been built, it's happened. The council have backed us, people are sitting in there eating the sandwiches on a miserable day because they're out of the tower block. People are going down with this little trowels and we're planting and it's, you know, the hops are growing up the soup trees now. So these are local things, but they include everyone. No one is leading them, um, but they are led. And um, two initiatives and they're working. And your initiatives are brilliant. So thank you for sharing. Lovely, thank you. Time for more reflection. Kevin. Yes. Kevin. Ahead, Marianne. Is that you, Marianne? Right. I'm yes. going to keep it short and as usual, you can um, tell me to shut up if I go off message, which happens. Um, Marbeth uh, reminded me of <clears throat> something I'd said in the very first webinar that we did about play dates for grown-ups, which is the thing I do uh, with my friends. And um, she said, mention that. So I'm just mentioning it as a concept of it's a community building, I suppose, a community building concept. And w since the lockdown, it's really started to move out a bit into my street or the, my immediate neighbors. 
um, has become a little community with a lot of sharing of stuff going on. But the play dates that I do, sometimes it might be just two of us and we will work on, because we're textile artists, we'll work on our own project and, and just have a day of, of talk and laughter and, and sewing. And sometimes I do an organized um, workshop and we might say do felting or make um, fabric paper or um, those kind of, it's always, always arts based. I'm just mentioning it in case anyone else thinks that it is a good idea. We do it for kids and, and, and um, make a space and a date um, for them to get together and play. So let's do it for grown-ups. And we could actually um, expand that to include our neighbors. I just do it with my friends. But actually, what is to stop you in your street, in your neighborhood from um, talking to your neighbors and saying, would you like to do that as well? Should we have a table out in the garden? And it's a no pressure thing. It, there's not, there's nothing about, you're not there to learn anything. You're not there to, to be good at anything. You're just there to have a bit of crack with, with, and with the arts. Thank you. Um, yes, and I think we find today that um, there's nothing stopping us doing that, actually. <laughs> so, so I think we have permission. So if you needed permission and this, this Zoom call can provide it to you, I'm, I'm summarily giving you permission um, if you need it, you have everything that you need to make a start. Um, so if that helps, um, you have permission. So I think it's time now, because I know people are running, and the, this is an incredibly busy uh, time. I know people are probably running to other meetings and all of that. So perhaps we can just all say goodbye. Thank you for your energy and contributions. Um, go well in your worlds. Um, and if you can make next week and you want to get involved and how things might move forward, it will be wonderful to see you all there. Um, and we'll send out some information again about that as the date approaches next week, same time, same virtual place. So listen, all the best. I'm going to wave goodbye. All you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Collective one. See you all later. Bye. Bye.